Welcome to another edition of Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And we're still looking at the temptation of Saint Anthony. And these are the outside panels. And these are the inside panels. In the center panel, we have Saint Anthony receiving a vision. On the left-hand panel, we have his life before he received that vision. And in the right-hand panel, it is his life after, when he sort of slips into retirement and writes his little sermons. Uh, but it's what happens before the vision that is going to give us a clue as to what his vision is all about. And so, that's what we'll look at first. Anthony may look like a wimp here, where he's beaten up by fish and frogs, and he turns into a building where he suffers great humiliation, or that he finally gets carried off the scene by his loyal friends, including Hieronymus Bosch. The adventures of St. Anthony happened a couple of hundred years before the time of Hieronymus Bosch. Bosch has merely painted himself into the picture to show his sympathies are with the saint. Prior to becoming the hot mess we see depicted in the left panel, Anthony was, by virtue of his education and his love of the Gospels and his wonderful speaking voice, uh, he was sent to various hot spots where heresy was breaking out. They'd send people like St. Anthony there to try to sway the people back to Mother Church. And when they failed, which they pretty much normally did, then the Pope would declare a crusade and kill them all. So Anthony was like, the human face, the kind face the church sent first. And then, if and when that didn't work, uh, it was blood and death. And so it's important to know a little, well, know that he was sent there to debate them, to make things clear, which means he had to learn their side of the argument equally as well as they did, because he was a very scholarly guy. That's what you would do. But, according to our panel, poor Anthony has been tormented, humiliated, and now he's beaten to the point of exhaustion. So now he's finally ready to receive a vision from God. He's finally been humbled. And he's going to receive that vision, and he, the vision he's going to receive tells him that the heretics were right all along. And so that's the vision he's been given. And we're going to use a little bit of that knowledge of the heretics he was arguing against to figure out what these symbols mean. So the heretics denied the divinity of Jesus and the value of the sacraments. So do we see any of that in the painting? Why, yes, we do. For instance, Anthony has got his back turned on the toad who is holding aloft an egg and being offered on a silver platter in exchange for a gold cup. This is clearly a parody of the Eucharist, which is held aloft by, the, by a priest. And an egg is the symbol of metamorphosis. Uh, an egg starts as a little container full of goo, but given time and nurturing, hatches out to be either a fish, a bird, or even a dragon. And, of course, the frog we identified earlier as the words coming out of the mouth of the false prophet and the beasts that go on to um, deceive the whole world. And so we have a vision here of the lies of the false prophet holding up an object of metamorphosis, of 
as in transubstantiation, and that is being offered in exchange for gold. In the right panel, we see the wine being poured out by a cadaverous man for a toad, toad baby, who is lounging in a butterfly manger. And so we have the bread and the wine, but it is the parody of the flight into Egypt that will help explain the rest of the painting for us. So then the question becomes, why? Why, why, why would Hieronymus Bosch make fun of the perfectly nice story of the flight into Egypt? And that's because there's a lot of magic involved in the story of the flight into Egypt, and there is no such thing as magic. So, we need to look for another explanation. So, the time has come to read the Bible, but before we do that, you need to be aware of a few things. One of them is that the Bible doesn't, especially the New Testament, does not put the books in their chronological order. The chronological order would be something closer to the letters of Paul, the other short letters, and then the Gospel of Mark. And that is the key. The Gospel of Mark is important because it's the oldest one we know about, and it begins with the baptism of Jesus and ends not with his resurrection or ascent into heaven, but it simply ends with the empty tomb. So the earliest book we have is Mark, and it has no nativity scene, no flight into Egypt, no choir of angels, none of the trappings of a divine Jesus. The Bible starts with the gospel according to Matthew, but there's something you need to know about the gospel according to Matthew. It's written in Greek, but we happen to know that it was originally written in Hebrew. Not only do we know it was written in Hebrew originally, but it, when it was written in Hebrew, it did not contain the stories of the birth of Jesus. It, like the book of Mark, began with the baptism of Jesus. The Gospel of John also begins with the baptism of Jesus. And so that's three Gospels that originally skip all the stories about the divine origin of Jesus, and that leaves only the Gospel of Luke. And we know Luke wasn't anywhere near Jesus at the time. He was a convert made by Paul, and so he is the least reliable witness of all the four Gospels. And so we know that the Gospel of Matthew has been tampered with. And so the Greek version of Matthew is a fraud. It's a trick. And you could say that the story of the flight into Egypt has been delivered to us by a rat, a giant rat. The giant rat is the Greek version of the book of Matthew. That suggests that the other horse's ass that's being ridden is the book of Luke. So the diarrhea being poured out by the Gospel of Luke is all the nonsense about uh, Bethlehem and the angels in heaven and the shepherds and so forth. And the real value of that story is that there are no angels, there are no gathering of witnesses for the resurrection of Jesus. Why would the angels make such a big fuss over the birth of Jesus when it's his resurrection that is supposed to be the most glorious event that's ever happened on heaven or earth? Uh, but no angels, no <laughs> appropriate trappings. In fact, Jesus has to run around proving that he 
was resurrected to the people that should have been invited by angels. There's nothing wrong with seeing him resurrected. The Bible lovers among you will want to know, how do we know about this original Hebrew version of Matthew? And we know about it because Eusebius tells us about it when he's complaining about the first heretics, the Ebionites. What little we know about the Ebionites is that they accepted the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew only, not the other Gospels. They denied the divinity and pre-existence of Jesus. Jesus was just a man born naturally to normal parents. They followed, as best as they could, the Sermon on the Mount. They were vegetarian. They lived communally. Um, just as Jesus lived communally. The Bible says that among the 12 apostles in Jesus, they had one purse. Where after Jesus' death, his disciples set up a congregation in Jerusalem where they had one purse. And so the Ebionites also lived according to this. And the Ebionites were a group formed in Jerusalem right after the death of Jesus. So they knew people who knew Jesus. They possibly even heard personally sermons by Jesus. They knew him personally. And that's who the Ebionites were. They were uh, centered in Jerusalem. They revered James, the brother of Jesus, and they were frequently at the temple. And they didn't take vows, which if you look at the life of St. Anthony, one of his big problems was he was bound by vows. He was bound by a vow of poverty, and he was bound by a vow of obedience to the church. And these are both things that pretty much got him into trouble. Uh, and they were poor. Uh, St. Anthony considered poverty to be a great virtue, as did St. Anthony the Great, who he was named after, as did Francis of Assisi. So the Ebionites were in perfect harmony with the philosophy of St. Anthony. But most importantly, they rejected Paul as a, an apostate. Paul was identified as that false prophet that came in that spoke the words that were like the words of a frog. So Paul is the apostate. Paul is the big villain, as it were, in uh, the pure world of the Ebionites, the ones who knew Jesus and did their best to try to follow him. And they were labeled as the earliest heretics. And what does the church do to heretics? It burns them to death, and it burns all of their literature with them. They don't stop it, just people. And that's why we have no original Hebrew gospel of Matthew, is because it was burned along with all of their other writings. So the only way we can know the Ebionites is to notice the negative. Notice what their critics are saying about them, which is how we sort of gleaned our little list here, but it's enough. We have enough to compare the Ebionites heresy with that of the Albigenses, uh, because they both denied the divinity and pre-existence of Jesus. They both tried to follow the Sermon on the Mount. They both lived communally and rejected property rights. They rejected the death penalty and the legitimacy of war. Uh, they taught, well, the Albigensians taught it was unlawful to kill animals, whereas the Church of St. Anthony was killing people, and they rejected Paul as an apostate. Basically, what Bosch has painted is the very moment when St. Anthony realizes the heretics were right. We'll reject Paul next time on Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. Thanks for watching.